here on Facebook Live. I am your host, John Lazar. I want to thank you for joining us. Okay, look, March Madness has ended. The baseball season has begun. And we find ourselves yelling and screaming at the TV. And let's be honest, if we're not yelling and screaming at the TV, we're yelling and screaming for our children or our grandchildren at some sporting event, or we're screaming and yelling at them. Either way, we're doing a lot of screaming and yelling. But did you know that all that activity really, really affects our vocal cords and could cause us some problems? So joining us today to talk about vocal disorder issues, vocal health, and what we can do to stop mistreating our vocal cords is Dan Sherwood. He's a clinical vocologist with the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. Dan, I want to thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank all right. You. So before I get started on my first question, Please define for our audience and those watching, what is a clinical vocologist? Uh, it's, it's a title, really. It means speech pathologist who specializes in rehab and retraining of the professional voice. Basically, there are only about 200 or fewer of us in the world who, with actually that designation requires a lot of special training, continuing education after graduate school. Uh, and you sort of work your way in, working with uh, people who use their voice to make their living. Dan was uh, kind enough to... Cutting in? Yeah. Hello, Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm just visiting. I'm checking to make sure your mic is on. It should be on. Okay. Is it not check. on? So much talking about your voice, we're not sure we're hearing your voice. There it is. All right. on. Yes, on. mic is on. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Mary Beth Morgan, ladies and gentlemen. Great living. Thank you, Mary Beth. See, I always say she takes care of me, and look, proof is in the pudding. Okay. Now that we had all that fun and excitement in, let's go back to what we're here to talk about. Okay. So thank you for explaining clinical vocologists. Greatly appreciate that. So let's, you brought this beautiful model here, this, this thing. It so, was beautiful at one time. Yeah, uh, it's still beautiful. <laughs> it still works. So um, it's, you know, it's there. It's here. So um, let's talk a little bit about the larynx, the voice box. Can you just, using this model, talk about what goes into our voice? Like, for example, what are we using when we talk? What are we overusing if we're screaming or yelling all the time or if we're singing too much? Okay. Can you just address some of those areas? Sure, can. Um, this is just a, a basic model of the larynx. This is the model, oh, this is the, a front view, like so this is, would be someone's Adam's apple here. Um, this is the bone, it's called a hyoid, that's at the base of your tongue. So the tongue-based muscles insert into here and a sheet of muscles and membranes that insert up here. So if we turn this, and look inside, you see your epiglottis here, it flips over like a little toilet lid to uh, close your airway during your swallow. We have a couple of little cartilages here called arytenoids, and they are kind of the, the housing for the vocal cords. The vocal cords sort of extend from them from back to front, and the cartilages move here to open and close the cords. Um, and when someone uses their voice, the cartilages bring the vocal cords to the midline. The air that we're exhaling from beneath sets them in a vibration, and we just continue that vibratory cycle like that. So in a normal voice production, the cords come together, the airflow really does the work. If we start recruiting too many extra muscles, then the vocal cords collide together too much and too forcefully, and that leads to various voice problems. So speaking of voice problems, what are some voice disorders, and can you describe some of the common vocal disorders that you might see in, in, in the practice? I can do that. I honestly, I don't use the word disorder very much. It has such a negative connotation. You know, we all have a voice and sometimes things can go awry. So sometimes I'll say impairment, difficulty. I mean, disorder, doesn't that just sound, ew? Um, so, you know, the most common things that happen, you know, viruses that attack the nerves that, uh, that control the muscles. So you can get a paralyzed vocal cord or just a weak vocal cord. Um, too much, too loud, too long, usually equals voice problem. The vocal cords collide too many times per day. Those collisions are too forceful. The cords can start growing little things on them to protect themselves from all that extra, uh, extra collision force. So they, they become little callus-like things and we call them nodules. Uh, other people can blow out their voice after a period of screaming and shouting and get little blood blisters we call polyps. Uh, sometimes they can hemorrhage a vocal cord with too much yelling and screaming, everybody's a little bit different in terms of what can happen. We're all, we're all very bio-individual. So how does someone know if they might have some type of, type of a vocal impairment <laughs> or voice <laughs> impairment? Uh, well, just listen to yourself for one thing. Any, any period of hoarseness, roughness in your voice that lasts more than a couple weeks is a red flag, especially if you're not ill. 
Um, some people will go to a sporting event and they'll scream and shout and cheer for their team or their kid on the soccer field or something. They're still hoarse two days later. There could be an issue. So yeah, just monitor yourself, uh, how it sounds and how it feels. If it feels effortful, if your voice fatigues after a period of talking, if people always say what and you think you're loud enough, then there might be an issue. But you're usually that two to three week time period, if, if it doesn't get better, seek help. So how are some um, vocal impairments or voice issues diagnosed? Um, mainly with visualizing. Uh, we have some very sophisticated technology lately that we can get uh, a little camera through the nasal passage or into the mouth and telescope looks down at the voice box so we can see the vocal cords moving and vibrating. And that's the key is to see the vibratory characteristics, not just gross anatomy and movement, but how they actually work when we talk. Joining us today is Dan Sherwood. Uh, what was the position? Vocal uh, vocologist, uh, clinical, clinical vocologist, vocologist with okay. the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at uh, GBMC. Dan, let me ask you this. If, if you have some type of a vocal impairment or you have some issues with, with your voice, and if you don't address it, what, what are some of the risk factors of avoiding seeking treatment or avoiding seeking you know, to go in for an appointment? Yeah, well, the easy, you know, for, for example, a, a school teacher, uh, they start their career and they talk all day long, they're vocal athletes, and they notice that as the semester goes by, the school year goes by, their, their voice gets rougher and rougher and rougher. Too many collisions per day, um, too forceful collisions, and they're just persistently hoarse. And a lot of people do, a lot of people who talk for a living, uh, again, too much, too loud, too long. That's the most common formula for any kind of voice problem. So yeah, you'll hear that, that persistent hoarseness, it doesn't get better, or it gets a little bit better with rest, and then you start talking again, and it gets worse. Um, if you do nothing about it, that's fine, you're just persistently hoarse. Some injuries to the vocal cords can get worse, um, but then there are some injuries that uh, are not just from use, but from abuse, and when I mean abuse, I mean you know, all our vices, you know, smoking, drinking, uh, things like that. Um, so we have to be very careful, if, especially if people are smokers. You have to be very careful. If your voice changes and it doesn't get better, you need to seek help because we're all familiar with the dangers of smoking. And on the vocal cords, there's, um, there's a lot of things that can happen there that are very bad. We need to keep an eye on it. So keep an eye on your voice. You know, uh, prior to a show, one of our uh, viewers sent in a question. Uh, her name is Karen. And Karen wants to know, certain medications and autoimmune disorders like systemic lupus can cause hoarseness, dry mouth, slash throat. Uh, what are the best ways to address this to get relief? Hmm. Well, that's about a 45-minute answer, Karen, when you start talking about medications and, and other medical diagnoses. But uh, often, when we, th when we think about autoimmune diseases that can affect the voice, I think the number one is often rheumatoid arthritis because that affects the movement of joints. So you can start getting weak vocal cords from that because the joint that moves the cord in here doesn't move as well. But otherwise, a lot of the other... A lot of the other diseases that we get and medical problems that we have, uh, it's often the, uh, the treatment for them that causes a lot of problems too. A lot of medications have drying effects, lots of medications have drying effects. Um, so we have to just, again, keep ourselves hydrated. There are over-the-counter products we can use for, you know, like the biotin products and things like that. I'm not endorsing anything specific, but there are, there are over-the-counter products to use to help keep, you know, some the artificial moisture in the mouth. Um, you know, any kind of pectin-based uh, throat lozenger is always good. Just to keep moisture. Um, again, drink water like it's going out of style. Karen, thank you for the question. And I do encourage our audience members and those watching us on Facebook today, please send in your question. You can provide your question via the comment section on our Facebook page. Take advantage of it. You got Dan Sherwood here from the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. You got an expert right here who can help you with your uh, any questions you might have with your voice or if you think you're having any uh, vocal issues. So, Dan, um, we talked about, you know, seeking help, right? But at the end of the day, how does someone, you know, take care of their voice, um, especially those that might be, you know, in different um, age stages. As you get older, how do you mm -hmm. care for your voice and what are some good rules of thumb whether you are a 30-year-old teacher or you're a 60-year-old choir member at mm -hmm. your church? What are some good rules or rule of thumb on taking care of your voice regardless of what age uh, level we might right. be? 
Well, if you're someone who uses your voice in any sort of athletic manner, think of any other athlete. Warm up, and if you're a singer, technical drills before you get into repertoire, and cool down when you're done. Pretty simple, exercise physiology 101. Right? Um, always keep the instrument in tune. We don't want to go days and days without keeping the muscles engaged in, in skilled and, and challenging activities so they will respond. And that's why God invented exercise, right? We just have to do it smartly. Uh, during the segment, I've mentioned the Johns Hopkins Voice Center. Um, what I'd like you to do, if, if you could, for our audience and our viewers, is talk a little bit about the Voice Center and one of the prize jewels that's within the Voice Center that not many people know about, the Fender uh, Music and Voice Studio. Can you briefly describe what each of them is and what services and benefits they have or they offer to patients? I can. Um, there's a lot that goes on in our Voice Center. Uh, we treat people with all kinds of uh, complaints about larynx, so it's, it's, it's voice, it's swallow, it's airway issues, um, and all, all the things that go on with the vocal cords. It's not just voicing. It's being able to regulate breathing. Uh, there are diagnoses, diagnoses where um, the muscles that move the vocal cords don't move the way they're supposed to, a paradoxical movement. So we, we treat people with these sort of upper airway breathing issues. Um, we treat, again, singers, actors, broadcasters, choir singers, school teachers, but also just, just regular folks who, you know, as the years go by and the years after retirement, and they're, they're, they don't use their voice so much anymore, and what happens is muscles can atrophy, so we, we rehab, um, you know, all kinds of various problems. We try to see people pre and post-op if they need sort of, sort of surgery. Um, we like to help people avoid surgery whenever possible, and that's, that's very good. We have various rooms for examination to visualize the larynx in action. We have treatment rooms to address various things. We have a movement room where we get people on a nice padded table to help unlock various aches and tensions in their bodies because it's hard for a nice, free, unrestricted voice to come out of a tight, painful body. Um, we have a treadmill we use to provoke certain episodes with these people with certain breathing pattern disorders. And we have our Fender room, which is there in the picture behind me. Um, so it's one of the most unique in the country, I think, in terms of voice centers. There's only one or two other places in the United States that has a room anywhere close to ours. It's, I think ours is the coolest. Um, and this is where we kind of can take a singer or a music teacher or someone who's fronting a band or uh, they're what we call working class singers often. Uh, they have a day job and they have to be careful how they use their voice during their, their day. Uh, so they can gig at night and do rehearsals. So we try to simulate their environment as much as possible. And if they're instrumentalists, they can sit at the piano, they can pick up an ax, and they can play and show us what they do. And we work on technique and posture and alignment and support and marrying all the elements of voice production to get the optimal use out of the instrument. How about hosts of a uh, Facebook Live show? Do you, can you see them as a patient? Uh, Just, I'm asking for know, a friend, actually. We, we turn away no one. That's <laughs> Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned all this. So my question to you is, how does someone uh, uh, inquire about getting an appointment, whether it's with the Voice Center or within the Fender Music um, uh, studio? Sure. Easy. It's very easy. I mean, phone numbers, you know, we certainly have phone numbers up the wazoo, but um, easiest to just go to our website, uh, gbmc.org slash voice, and there are directions to get you anywhere. There's all kinds of information on there, not just an appointment line but all their information about, uh, about vocal health, about vocal problems, and some educational things, uh, pictures, things like that. So it's kind of a robust website. And you can always make an appointment if you think you have a problem or need something. We have actually a question from an audience member, Laura. Yes, so this question is from Barb. Um, how are vocal cords treated? How do you help alleviate those symptoms? For sy symptoms? Sure, sure. Uh, well, yeah, that's a very common question. Um, no, Laura, are you asking for someone else, or? <laughs> she said Barbara. That was okay. for um, our Barbara. audience. Okay, so, uh, excuse me. Uh, well, Barbara, um, again, very common question, because we're all getting older. That's, you can't stop that. But think of, uh, again, going back to the principles of exercise physiology. We've all heard use it or lose it, right? So if you keep the voice engaged in challenging and skilled activities, um, the muscles can stay toned. Usually in the years after retirement, we don't use our voices nearly as much anymore. We're just sort of doing our own thing and we don't use our voice athletic. We're not talking all day, we're not on the phone all day, we're not in meetings, we're not giving presentations. And the muscles can atrophy. And that's a natural part of aging is our muscles can atrophy. It gets a little bit smaller. We lose mass, but we don't have to lose function. So just keep the voice engaged. Read aloud every day, use your voice. 
And that's, that's really the basic principle, use it or lose it. The muscles can respond if we ask it of them. The, the demand will create the supply. Again, joining us today here on To Your Health is Dan Sherwood, a clinical vocologist with the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. And again, that website to get an appointment is? Uh, GBMC.org slash voice. All right, fantastic. Uh, we had a question that came in from one of our viewers before the show today. Her name is Michelle, and she says, I am a singer, and I've noticed or experienced trouble with my voice. It always feels like I'm straining to sing. Could there be some type of nodule on my vocal cords? I've had my throat checked many years ago, but cannot remember the results. Can you offer a suggestion for this issue or a test specifically for a problem such as mine? Michelle, yes, get the 2NENT and take another look. If you think you're having a problem and it's ongoing, then it definitely needs to be visualized. You need to get to not just a general ENT, but if you're a singer, you want a fellowship trained laryngologist, like we have at our center, um, because we want to look at vibration of the vocal cords. We want to look, we can pick up on any little subtleties that only maybe you know, and maybe your audience can't hear. Um, I'd probably want to know if Michelle had a voice teacher that she works with. Mm -hmm. And you know what's going on technically, what can she do and can she not do, what's changed. But if there's effort there, that's coming from somewhere. It's often just a technical issue. People work out with their voice teachers. But sometimes there's a problem. There, there could be weakness on one side, a little cold or virus can attack a nerve, and all of a sudden you have a little bit of a weakness. Or you've done something wrong. Maybe you've gone from one challenging role to another in a performance and weren't ready for it and asked too much of your voice. So it's always good to have a look. If you, if you have a problem that persists, get to a laryngologist and, and look at it and see if it needs any further attention. Again, I encourage our audience members and those at home, if you have a question for Dan, uh, please submit it in the comments section. If we don't get to it before the end of our show, we will have Dan answer that question for you at the end of To Your Health today. But we do have a couple of questions from our audience. Laura. Okay, so we have a question that's gonna be asked by our live audience member. Hi, I'm actually Michelle. <laughs> I'm the one that submitted the question, but uh -huh. I heard you with your suggestion, but I wouldn't come to see you? Well, not me personally. I mean, yeah, no one sees me without some sort of a diagnosis or a prescription, you know, because I'm, I'm the rehab therapy kind of person. You want to see the doctor, the laryngologist, who can do the examination and visualize the larynx and see what's happening and decide what's the best course of treatment. So is that someone that you're associated with? Maybe I missed that. Yeah, one of, the, one of the doctors who works okay. in our clinic. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Sure, absolutely. Lord, do we have another question? Several others that have come in. Um, so does Parkinson's disease affect the voice in any way? In about 89, 90% of cases it does. And it's often a first sign of Parkinson's in, in a lot of cases. Voices will start to getting weaker and breathy and motor speech sometimes gets affected and people are always having to lean in to say what and having people to repeat themselves. So yes, uh, there are specific, uh, you know, very efficaciously studied rehab programs for the voice problems associated with Parkinson's. It's very common. We also have a few more. I'm gonna combine them because we have a couple questions asking about whether things um, can harm the voice. So do things like uh, constant post-nasal drip, clearing your throat or um, inhaling helium damage your cords. <laughs> Do you ever get that? Is that, that uh, inhaling helium? Well, I haven't done that since I was this tall and going to Disneyland. Um, but I, I, don't, I haven't personally heard about helium because of the, the effects are very temporary. But, you know, it is a chemical. Do you want that in your body, you know, in your airway and in your lungs? Because anything that's going through that you inhale is going all the way down. Um, so you want to be careful about that. But otherwise, I'm sorry, give me the other part of the question because I got stuck on the helium bit. <laughs> So symptoms like post-nasal drip and um, yeah. clearing your throat on sure. a consistent basis. Well, if we think about, if we use my hands here, if I don't have to tip this over here because these arytenoid cartilages that move the, uh, the cords. If you think about your hands, these are my arytenoid cartilages. So if you think about your vocal cords, they open and close, right? So when we talk about things like a nice little massage, this would be a swallow. And here's a throat clear. Here's a cough. Imagine doing that excessively. All right, red, mad, swollen. So anytime you clear your throat or cough, especially boisterously, that's a very aggressive kick on those cords and it can irritate that tissue done repeatedly. One of the things about post-nasal drip, you know, anybody in this room did not have post-nasal drip, at least on occasion, what's causing it? Are we hydrated enough? 
are we have are we do we have allergies and asthma or anything like that? Something treated is, and I hate to say this, but reflux, opening a can of worms, that can lead to some postnasal drip problems too. So you know any sinonasal complaints, you know you want to address that with uh, with your ENT, you know nose type of specialist, and see what might be the root cause of that, or just your primary care physician. You know what medications could you be on, or what medications should you be on to to address that? We only have a couple more minutes left on our program. There is one thing that I wanted to um, talk with you about today: uh, World Voice Day. It's Tuesday next week, April sixteenth. Mm -hmm. Every year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of that date and about a special employee event? taking place this Friday at GBMC. Yeah, well, GBMC takes care of their employees, I will say that, uh, and we'll talk about that. But um, World Voice Day, again, it's something that goes on every year. It's sponsored by the Voice Foundation. It's been going on since, I think, the early 70s. And it's just kind of what we're doing here today, just talking about awareness of, of taking care of our voice and maintaining it and keeping our voice healthy. Because, again, when you think about how many of us combed our hair this morning, how many of us got dressed and we maybe put on makeup or something, because what we look like and what we sound like are such fundamental elements of our very identity. So taking care of our voice is important. And World Voice Day is meant to just say, hey, let's just call awareness to that and take care of your voice. You only get one. Can't take out the larynx and put in a new one. You develop what you have and you make the most of what you have because it's your instrument. And we are using the voice as an instrument this Friday. In fact, day after tomorrow, we have a, an event that we're doing for World Voice Day at our, our center in our, uh, we're, we're turning our, Campus Conference Center into a, a, a concert hall, basically. And we have a nice four employees, by employees, sort of morale boosting, team building event that's a lot of fun. Last year was our kind of inaugural event. We did it as a pilot project where we recruited, I say we, I mean me, mm -hmm. recruited basically singers from all over campus. There's a lot of really great vocal talent on the GBMC campus. And they're going to get up and perform. We're going to have a showcase of vocal talent. And it's a lot of fun. It's catered. And we just it's just a nice way to say thank you for in your employment. Thank you for taking care of your voice and celebrate it uh, with a nice special event. So, um, you know, in the intro, I talked about baseball and the start of the baseball season. So I'm now throwing a curveball into this program. I'm about ready to do something I have never done. You are my litmus test. You're my guinea pig. Okay. So we're going to do a little segment called True or False. I'm going to ask Dan a couple of questions. He's going to ask him true or false and explain why? Are you ready, Dan? True. True. Okay. Uh, caffeine is better than tea when it comes to hydrating your vocal cords or keeping them healthy. True or false? False. Why? Uh, well, caffeine, of course, is going to draw fluid out of tissues, so it's, it can help it contribute to dehydration. And tea, whether it's caffeinated or not, is a surface desiccant. It's going to dry out surface tissues. So there's no replacement for good plain room temperature water. Mentholated cough drops are bad for the vocal cords, true or false? Generally true. Um, if you're actually sick and need a cough drop, okay, but just be nice to your voice during that time. But by and large, menthol is like vocal kryptonite. It's, it's a well-known laryngeal irritant. It dries you out and it can irritate the tissue. So if you're not sick, stay away from menthol or eucalyptus or anything medicy or, or ar aromatic. Uh, foods with high water content, like watermelon and cucumbers, are good for the vocal cords. True or false? True, if you don't aspirate them. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those things, when you chew those water content foods, the, the, the liquid part squirts down, and you can choke on it while you're still chewing, so be careful. All right. And our last true or false question, uh, question today is, singers should eat chocolate on their performance days because it helps them with their voice, and it helps their voice sound crystal clear true or false and why both and i have no idea <laughs> i mean it, it sounds like one of those home remedies someone just came up with and just sort of psyched themselves out but you know there's there's nothing i've ever heard there's certainly no then there might be anecdotal evidence on it but there's anecdotal evidence about a lot of things so if it works for you i say go ahead but if you're going to eat chocolate in terms of voice dark 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 85 88 percent cacao milk chocolate yeah not so much this is why I love having him on the show. He's honest, right? Yeah, yeah. He gave you a quick, honest explanation. Dan, I want to thank you for joining us today. Dan Sherwood, clinical vocologist from the Johns Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming in the studio today and those joining us on Facebook uh, to come in and listen to Dan and offer some great information on the ways to protect your voice. 
Um, stand by as the conversation turns to head neck cancers with uh, Mary Beth Marsden on on Greater Living Live. Next month, uh, please join me on To Your Health as our program focuses on nursing. And um, it focuses on nurse recruitment and our nurses as leaders within the health care industry. So join us here on To Your Health next month on Wednesday, May 8th, I believe. That is the date if my calendar, unless if I was looking at 2020, I believe that it is May 8th next month. So I look forward to having you all in the studio again and you uh, joining us on Facebook Live. Dan, again, I want to thank you for being here today. My pleasure. I appreciate it. And here's a cheers and to your health.